My guest tonight has been talking about the dangers of climate change for as long as I have been alive. He's a journalist and founder of the grassroots climate activist group 350.org. We've burned enough coal and gas and oil to raise the temperature of the earth one degree. What has that done? There was a day last September when the headline in the paper was half the polar ice cap is missing. Literally. I mean, if Neil Armstrong were up on the moon today, he would look down and see half as much area of ice in the Arctic. We've taken one of the largest physical features on earth and we have broken it. Please welcome Bill McKibben. <laughs> Hello, Bill. Good to be here. Thank you for being here. Do you ever get sick of touring the world and just bumming everybody out? <laughs> well, there's a, uh, you have to look for a certain amount of comedy in the middle of this. Uh, you know, we were on the Great Barrier Reef last weekend and it was depressing as hell and, every, and we came up from underwater and someone turned on the news and there was the, the government, Mr. Frydenberg, uh, saying, well, we've, we're going to solve this problem by taking on the crown of thorns starfish, you know, and, and, and the fact that you could be simultaneously pretending to care about the largest reef in the world and promoting the largest coal mine in the world, that's comedy gold. I mean, <laughs> right there. Yeah, look at them laughing their asses off there, Bill. <laughs> we'll get to that in a sec. Yeah, I know you're very passionate about the Adani issue, but just so people know, you named your organization 350.org because 350 parts per million is what climate scientists tell us is the safe upper limit uh, for, for carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. A number we're sadly way north of. We hit, what are we at now? We hit last week 412 parts per million for the first time in 15 million years. Okay, all right. Well, first time for everything, that's yeah. good. <laughs> How do we get to 350 parts per million? The, the only way we deal with climate change is to stop burning coal and gas and oil and start using the sun and the wind to power our lives. That was hard to think about 10, 15 years ago because those new technologies weren't quite ready. But now they are. I mean, you watched Mr. Musk put up a huge battery in Australia in the course of 90 days. If we worked with that kind of dispatch and vigor around the globe for the next few years, we'd, we wouldn't solve this problem, but we'd have a start on it. Our problem is we're not doing that because the fossil fuel industry stays strong enough to keep us from even trying. But jobs, Bill. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Why do you hate jobs? You want to kick jobs in the face. So you, the you good fucking, news is... You anti-job, job hater. The good news is there are three, four, five times as many jobs in this conversion to renewable energy. This is going to be the biggest economic task probably humanity's ever undertaken. And if we do it wisely and smartly, those jobs will be not only plentiful, they'll be here close to home. No one's going to put their you know, house on a boat and send it to China to get solar panels installed. People who advocate for climate policies often talk about a just transition from that. So if we're going to move to this new clean economy, then we can help the people who work in the fossil fuel industry at the moment transition. Sometimes that feels a little bit like bullshit to me because I feel like a 50-year-old Queensland coal miner is not going to retrain and learn how to build a solar panel or learn how to code or what have you. Is it more realistic to say that, no, we're just actually going to pay those people out and give them money and say That's thanks right. for people, your People should not be who can't... That whatever point in their life retrain to do something else, they shouldn't be held responsible for the fact that the world has changed and we have to move on. We've got the funds to do that. What we don't have is the time to keep indulging the fossil fuel industry. The coal industry basically, in my country, in this country, around the world, uses workers as a kind of hostage to keep from having to deal with the fact that their product is wrecking the planet. We, we really like coal in Australia. We, I was in Newcastle over yeah. the uh, weekend. It's almost sexual. Uh, <laughs> former PM said coal is good for humanity. We had politicians bringing lumps of I coal into Parliament. I watched the guy bring the, it was the pass around the rock to look yeah. at it. That was, and if you think about it, there's something, I mean, it's like they're all gazing in awe at what's really 18th century technology. Like, these are not the guys to lead the way into the future if they're well, like gazing at lumps of coal. <laughs> The Minerals Council of Australia disagrees. This is a real ad they made. This is not a sketch we made. This is a genuine ad that the Minerals Council of Australia put together in 2015. Take a look. This can provide endless possibilities. It can create light and jobs, delivering $6 billion in wages for Australians. It produces steel and powers our homes, as well as our economy, injecting $40 billion each year 
and it can now reduce its emissions by up to 40%. It's coal. Isn't it amazing what this little black rock can do? Does that make you a wreck, Bill McKibben? <laughs> It, it kind of brought me down, you know. <laughs> I was going there pretty good. But... Okay, right. You have said that the Adani fight is the most important environmental fight in Australian history. Are you going to win that fight? I think so. I, look, every month that it doesn't happen, the price of a solar panel or a kilowatt of hour from wind goes down another two, three percent. It already makes no sense. That's why they can't find any bankers to back the thing. That's why they're trying to make sure that Australian taxpayers are on the hook. But past a certain point, no one's going to do this. I mean, this is clearly not about the future. This is yesterday's technology. And the, the, the route that we're supposed to go is so obvious. I mean, uh, I mean, the fact that the sun, I mean, we, they talked about coal as a kind of magic miracle. Think about what a solar panel is. You aim a sheet of glass at the sun, and out the back, comes light and communications. And, I mean, that's a Hogwarts scale miracle, okay? It doesn't require you to dig up vast chunks of the planet, ship it all across the world in boats, burn it, produce, I mean, it, this is elegant, simple, beautiful technology. Isn't it fair to say the storage technology is not up to scratch yet though? Like, can we actually store this stuff long enough to provide for all our energy needs? That's what they were saying before Mr. Musk built his battery and it's worked like a charm. I mean, humans are good at technology. Given the right incentives, we're able to make these kind of changes. The problem is that the people who own coal mines or oil wells don't want it to happen. And we know now, because great investigative reporting over the last few years has uncovered the fact that the, the, the big guys, the big oil companies say, knew everything there was to know about climate change 30 years ago. Exxon started building its drilling rigs to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was coming, okay? But what they didn't do was tell any of the rest of us. They invested hundreds of millions of dollars building this phony, you know, sham front groups and so on, and starting an utterly sterile debate that's lasted a quarter century about whether global warming was real. A debate both sides knew the answer to when it began. It's just one of them was willing to lie. And they're pretty good liars. I mean, you saw the, you know, the kind of ad. They bring good production values to this. They've now convinced the president of the United States that global warming was a hoax manufactured by the Chinese. If you heard someone saying that, if you were sitting next to somebody on a public bus and they started muttering about global warming as a hoax manufactured by the Chinese, you'd get up and move three seats, you know, to avoid them. But that's what happens if you have hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on propaganda. Are we fucked? Uh, it de <laughs> depends on, on, on the degree of fuckedness you're worried about. <laughs> um, uh, we raised the temperature of the planet one degree so far. That's cost us half the ice in the Arctic and half the Great Barrier Reef. We're headed for two degrees unless we take heroic measures. In fact, on current business as usual, Paris Accord kind of path, the planet will warm three and a half degrees Celsius in the course of this century. That's warmer than it's been since before the beginning of primate evolution, okay? So, yeah, we're not in a really good place. Okay, well, <laughs> bumming us out there. You can catch Bill at the Lower Town Hall in Sydney tomorrow that he heads to Canberra, Melbourne, Adelaide, Darwin and Perth this week if you want to find out more. For now, would you please thank him, Bill McKibben. <laughs>